All right, now our last session before lunch. This is Australia's role in driving offshore wind growth in the Asia Pacific. My name is Morgan Rossiter and I lead the offshore wind policy for the Clean Energy Council. Before I start, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the, Torres, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we all work and live. And today, we're meeting on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Now, as an industry, as we accelerate the transition to a clean energy future, it's important that we commit to collaborate with First Nations communities to promote sustainable practice, protect ancient sites and culture with equitable access to the benefits of clean energy. I note that sovereignty has never been ceded and acknowledge elders past and present and their continuing culture and connection to country and sea country. Now, as we heard yesterday and earlier today, there are many markets in various stages of development across the APAC region, some just starting out and some already generating a clear, a clean offshore electrons. Now, as Australia keeps uh, hastening our offshore agenda, it's only apt uh, that this session we explore how Australia can solidify its position in the region by tackling the not, not small question of how can Australia harness its offshore wind potential to bolster the allure of the entire APAC region for global offshore investors. Now, we're going to hear about how we can unlock Australia's vast offshore wind resources and ignite a renewable energy revolution. Now, to do this, uh, we are going to hear from our expert panel, um, but we would also like to hear from the audience. So, uh, as with the previous sessions, please ask your questions through the app, or if you're feeling up to it, um, you can come up to the microphone as well. So, I will now head over and introduce our panellists. All right, now I might start with um, Fernando. So Fernando Santamaria, Executive General Manager at Iberdrola. Um, now you're leading the onshore growth, or sorry, the offshore growth expansion in the wider Asia Pacific region, including Australia and other um, geographies in Asia. So um, from your perspective, what are some of the specific advantages that Australia has that can help the offshore wind industry to, to develop in the Asia Pacific region? Thank you, Morgan. Hi, everyone. Um, I think probably the first one I will highlight, Australia is an investment-friendly country, and we've seen over this couple of days how many uh, credible and big investors are really keen to, to come to Australia to build this industry. Obviously, Petrola is one of them, but uh, this is really positive in this time of attracting uh, experience and, and capital into new markets. The other one I may consider is um, we've talked about challenges and labor, having a skilled people to drive this industry, it's, it's going to be one of them. Australia is such a rich country in terms of good education, universities, talent. I think that's a great platform for not only bringing the workforce of the future in Australia, but also to export that talent into other regions. So I will probably start with those two. I think definitely making sure we're bringing the skills along is, is such an important component. Um, now, I might move down to the, to the end, to Eric, Eric Antunes, the co-CEO of Parkwind. And I know we always talk about collaboration with our offshore wind, so co-CEO, I think, is a very great example of, of collaboration. Uh, now, Noble Wind, the offshore wind farm in Belgium, uh, is in the North Sea, and it's a joint venture between Parkwind and two other organisations. Um, do you think this model would sort of be suitable for other Australian entities, and, and how do we go about sort of replicating that? Well, <clears throat> basically, on uh, all of our European projects, we've been working in this uh, GV structure, huh, where we always have partners. We try to have several types of partners, depending on, on the market we're in. We have, for instance, in one of our projects, we have a municipal uh, um, company, you know, with municipal shareholders participating to the project. We have in some of our other projects, we have even citizens corporations, you know, citizens putting, investing money into, into a, a kind of co collaborative uh, society, investing in our projects, which also helps, you know, in terms of uh, social acceptance. We try to work together with local partners, um, and it's a philosophy we apply in, in any market, and which we think it's also a key to success in most markets. We can bring, as a developer, you know, uh, the, the knowledge and the experience, having 
developed successfully, I can say, several projects over the last 10 years. We can bring that experience, that knowledge, but we also need local partners, let's say, to bring uh, the local, local content and to bring, let's say, also the link with local governments, uh, local societies, which is quite important success factors uh, for, uh, for offshore wind. So it is definitely a model that, that I think would work for Australia as well. Thanks. Uh, Matt Dickey, you're Head of Regulatory Affairs for Asia-Pacific Region at RWE Renewables. Uh, what do you think we need to see from the government to ensure bankability for offshore wind in Australia? Uh, thanks, Morgan. Yeah, great question. Um, look, I think looking around APAC, we can probably take some lessons from, from other countries. And, um, you know, I, I think we really like the model that is evolving in Japan where there is a, a single auction for both seabed lease and subsidy, and it gives investors and developers a lot more confidence. Obviously, that requires a lot of upfront work by governments to um, do the, the seabed scanning and to get across all the different impediments that might be in play for, for different offshore regions. But, um, you know, we're probably that ship sailed, I think, for Australia. So we need to look at how we can avoid the situation where with a two-step auction like we currently have, the first auction, you end up with financial bids and you know, companies putting lots of money on the table only to then go to state governments and, and ask to get it back in, in the subsidy auction. So you know, one way I think that can be solved is just by tweaking the current model where in the seabed leases, the overlap process that's currently set up, it does um, have some difficulties in regards to competition law. And so if projects that are judged to be of equal merit um, and, and are overlapping, the government um, sort of says, go off and negotiate with each other and try and redraw your boundaries. But the lawyers are telling us that's, that's a no-go zone. That's, um, you know, there's potential for cartel conduct in that. So we need to be very careful about how that has actually played out. And I think at the moment that will lead probably to a really ineffective resolution process and everyone will end up in financial bids. But if the merit assessment approach could just be tweaked so that it's less of a pass-fail but more of a merit order, and then the, the top project for each overlapping zone is, um, is selected, I think that would be one easy way around it, or to get ACCC authorisation for, for this um, to occur. Definitely know the Clean Energy Council, the Competition and Consumer Act challenge is, is a really big discussion at the moment and I'll know the session following this after lunch is uh, with um, some stakeholders of the federal government so maybe we can uh, bring that up with them and <laughs> see what the guidance is there. And now Henrietta Holm, the Director of Orsted, um, you have a, or Orsted have a very healthy 5.6 gigawatts planned uh, in the Gippsland region, um, which will be great for, you know, the Victorian target. We'll be halfway to our 20, 2040 target if uh, that project becomes successful. Um, with Orsted's extensive existing uh, experience in developing offshore wind farms, um, what are some of the key challenges uh, and delays that you would caution the industry um, or the Australian industry to be wary of and, and how could we either work around them or, or overcome them? Thank you, Morgan. Well, I, I see sort of some of the, the specific challenges is, um, is uh, first of all, the, the grid, as we also heard from the key note speakers yesterday. And I think that uh, Victoria shouldn't really be worried about uh, anticipatory investments in, in grid um, and uh, just need to get started with the, the build out for, for the six plus gigawatts of, of grid needed um, for the Gippsland area. And uh, I'm quite confident the projects will be built out, even if it isn't uh, Erstel's project that's, that's going ahead. But uh, yeah, clearly we see, uh, see that uh, challenge uh, can be solved uh, if, if, um, if we start now. Yeah. And um, yeah, the other one is, is the supply chain. It, it will be needing um, an organic uh, and sustainable um, growth. Um, and um, that requires some, some flexibility. And uh, we see, um, we see th three things that can, can, can ensure that. First of all, sort of adopting a, a bottom-up approach um, to unlock sort of the lowest hanging fruits. Um, and um, 
and then really sort of um, continued uh, coordination between the Australian states uh, to make sort of sure that uh, the, um, the full utilization of facility build um, and um, to make sure they are cost efficient and, and sustainable. And uh, yeah, finally, sort of, we would like to see other states uh, do like, like Victoria and sort of set targets so that, that we can sort of uh, provide suppliers with that investment signal that will also be helpful for, for sort of the, yeah, the Victoria projects. Agree with you there on the targets. I think we'd all like to see them set. Uh, Danny Nielsen, Country Manager and Senior Vice President of Australia New Zealand for Vestas. Now, it's good to have an OEM up here. Um, we uh, often talk about the need to establish supply chains. I think it's a very common one that's always coming up. Um, and I think the most common example people give when they're talking about establishing supply chains when it comes to offshore wind is, you know, do we need to manufacture turbines domestically? But as an OEM, what do you see the best approach um, for an organisation like Vestas is to supply um, the Australian market? I think when, when we look at supply chain, we, we kind of look at the whole value chain. Um, and it always starts with uh, policy certainty. As soon as you have policy certainty, you can, you can invest. Um, at the moment, we have, I would say, the targets that support uh, the renewables in, in Australia and, and uh, very important bipartisan support, plus minus a few percentage. But the framework for offshore wind is not there yet for, for taking those decisions. And uh, I just heard on the panel before that five, four, six years before, before they, they expect the, the, the first um, project to, to, to close. And, and that's probably a little bit too far out in the future and too much uncertainty to determine what are the best approach um, uh, for what you can say a supply chain setup. Secondly, uh, volume determines uh, how you set up your supply chain. Volume and then a continuous flow of volume coming through. Because if you have a start and stop industry, well, it makes no sense to put what you can call local production up if, if uh, you want to create uh, local jobs. So policy, certainty, volume, and longevity is the things we, we, we look for when, when we go down. Of course, cost always comes in uh, that uh, there has to be a business case for, for the developer and the uh, IPPs as well. Thanks. And just a reminder as well, uh, if anyone has any questions, to put them in the app. Make sure they um, drop down for this session, the Pacific session. Um, I might just stick another question for you, um, Danny. Um, you know, as the SVP for Australia and New Zealand, what opportunity do you see for uh, Australia and New Zealand to sort of unite across the ta Tasman to get their nascent industries off the ground? I think when, when you look at it, Australia already have a, an offshore industry, uh, maybe not as, as big as some, some wish, but, but the skill sets that we get out of, of Australia is, is really, really good, and the knowledge base. So the education system here in, in Australia is really good. The graduates, the engineers, is, is, a, great, um, is a great export, um, what you can call it, a driver, and, and we have used that a lot in, in the quiet years. I would say at the moment our biggest our biggest concern is to to get enough of that skill set just to drive the industry in Australia, but we we really as an industry need to embrace to get people into the renewables and then make that an export um, entity as well. If I can make a, a comment on a personal note uh, based on that. And I know the Minister Brown this morning also discussed about, you know, reskilling people and people perhaps feeling threatened and working today in coal-fired uh, power plants. Uh, well, I, I have an engineering, academic engineering background, and I worked for more than 20 years in a traditional utility. Uh, as a young engineer, I was commissioning gas-fired power plants. So I'm perhaps the living example <laughs> that people can change. Some like 10 years ago, I took a personal turn towards this renewable industry. So for the people in the room that may be still active in fossil fuel, there is a future after fossil fuel. I'm perhaps the, the living example of that. <laughs> 
Just leading, or following on from that question, what opportunities do you see? Obviously, we've got a well-established oil and gas offshore industries in Australia. You know, what are the sort of, I guess, the low-hanging fruits or the, or the easy opportunities for us to link in with that industry to help accelerate offshore wind in Australia? Well, <clears throat> I think Australia has a vast uh, potential. Uh, so we are enormous coastlines. Uh, in my, my own country, we have 65 kilometers of coastline. And today we have 2,200 uh, megawatts installed. And the ambition of the government is to install another six, but then our sea will be entirely full uh, with windmills. So there is a vast resource in, in Australia, uh, obviously, which is a big potential. Of course, creating also, I think, opportunities for Australia to be a um, supplier of green fuels uh, based on, on renewable energy uh, for the APEC region and, and even beyond that uh, on, a, on a global scale afterwards. So I think that's one of the opportunities that, that you have as a country, um, even if you may not require all the energy yourself. So. Uh, I may add, uh, oil and gas obviously has many skills that could be transferred into offshore. All the marine environment, all the work we do underwater with fauna, uh, all how to manage that, geotech studies, how to operate in that complex and fragile environment, that's, that's one of the key elements of getting it right. But also, wider Australia has a, a great background of, of mega projects. Even in onshore, we see projects in a scale that are not very common in other countries. We talk about gigawatts uh, in one single project, which are phenomenal. And even batteries, so we've been talking about hydrogen. All these mega complex projects being, bring many skills that offshore require to be a success. Anyone else? No? Um, now, just moving on to, to, to local content, um, there's often arguments that local content requirements can sort of distort competition, increase prices and the overall, overall investment risk, um, yet they're also really important to help foster sort of nascent industries and generate domestic employment and create opportunity and buy-in um, for renewables. Is there a way we can ensure local content requirements um, support the APAC region as a whole and we avoid seeing any um, economies disadvantaged or delayed by their introduction? But if, if I may, um, <clears throat> I would like to make a suggestion to, to the, let's say not Australia, but APEC region. Um, in a sense, I think you need to be, I, of course, local content is important. And, and I, we heard also had the message this morning of your minister creating local jobs. And that is, of course, important. But I think the suggestion would be to do that in a smart way. Uh, not every country uh, will be able uh, to have a turbine factory, for instance, from, from Vestas or Siemens or whatever. So the smart way of doing is perhaps in, in regional collaboration and um, perhaps country by country defining for yourselves what is your really strong point in what can I be a champion and attract that part of the supply chain rather than trying to compete between countries, you know, attracting, uh, attracting all kinds of te technology. So that would be my suggestion and, and let the market and the developers then determine uh, where they, they, they put their investments and, and let's say that would be from a cost point of view probably the optimal solution uh, for the region. Yeah, but I, I, I have always had mixed feeling on, on local content. Uh, so local content should come after the right policy settings because you, you don't want to have a industry that starts and stop. And, and when you have seen local content coming in, it's quite often come in with very short-term goal. Uh, we need to build one gigawatt. We want this local content, right? So, so what you've seen is that you open and shut factories within two and a half years, and that's not fair to anyone, right? As a, the, the, you, you have to attract workers, you have to train them, but you also want to maintain their work for, for many years to come. Um, and therefore, we as an industry have to be better, uh, along with the politician, to design the right framework for that to happen because no one wants to take people on for two, two years, it's not fair, and then let them go again. Yeah, I totally agree, Danny. And um, on the other side, I, I did used to work in government and, and ran renewable energy tenders, and 
So I know the pressure that um, governments are under to create jobs and investment. Um, and, you know, in Australia, it's even come down to state by state competing. So we really need to avoid that across APAC. And yeah, I like your idea of some sort of regional collaboration and a, a, at least a dialogue so that each country can understand the specialties of each other and, and hopefully, um, yeah, work collaboratively. Yeah, no, I think um, as mentioned that local content will come with the scale. And, uh, but yeah, it has to be in a sustainable way. Um, and um, I think it's also important for, for Australia to sort of recognize and sort of explore export potential because there's huge potential out there and we really need it. Uh, there's a supply chain cross and uh, yeah, so really sort of try to look at what are the, the strengths and what can Australia offer uh, and, and then also focus on, on the export potential because that will also benefit um, the local market. Yeah, we've got a great range of experience um, from Global Offshore Wind uh, um, companies here. Now, Henrietta, I wanted to ask you, you're the country manager for Japan. Um, what are some regulatory measures that um, Japan has introduced to help establish the offshore wind industry that you see could be valuable for Australia? Um, I, think, um, I think sort of some of these, um, having these joined, uh, joined up conversation uh, across uh, 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 governments, uh, departments, uh, agencies, and so on, and, and really involving industry in those discussions, I think that is key. Um, uh, and yeah, I really want to applaud Victoria and the Commonwealth for having done that here for, for the licensing round in, in, uh, in Gippsland. But um, I think that that needs to continue, and we encourage that that will continue also when when we start uh, see coordination for, for supply chain and budgets so that, yeah, that, that can really be, be taken forward so we can work together to create a sustainable industry. I, I will add, I think Japan um, has done a great job on, on community engagement, bringing local communities, fishermen, taking care of environmental requirements. Obviously, they have a, a big challenge, limited land they need, uh, floating coming, but they also have a very pristine coastline, and I think they, there's plenty of lesson learned from that community engagement that uh, could be beneficial for some of the Victorian communities. Thanks. Now, there's some analysis by Bloomberg NEF, and it found that it's at about the three to four gigawatt mark uh, that a cost step change occurs for, um, for offshore wind for a new market, and they can benefit from streamlining of projects and supply chains. Um, a question for the group. What are the essential pillars for success um, for a new industry, um, such as Australia, to hit that three to four gigawatt benchmark and start seeing um, that cost step change? I, I can start on that one. So I think I think the opportunities is great, but but also have to look a little bit towards onshore in in, in that discussion, uh, because a lot of the a lot of the drivers for 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 running a a what you can call it an opportunity for for an industrial sector actually rest on on the same. Uh, and again, it, it comes to that longevity of policy settings because if you want sub-suppliers to go in and invest, and, and I'm not just talking in factories and I'm not just talking in, in trucks and all that. We, we, we need the whole supply chain. If, if you look at what's going on in, in our country now, is that a simple thing as civil work, electrical work, um, truck drivers, uh, all that supply chain is, is suffering due to what you can call it um, the infrastructure boom we are, we are doing in, in, in Australia. And, and we are also building 10,000 kilometers of um, transmission line at the same time. So when we get that policy settings correct, people will start investing into those capabilities. They will invest into the longevity of the industry. And at the moment, we see there's, um, there's a project popping up here. There might be an offshore uh, project popping up there. We have 48 licenses in Victoria out. It's going to come out. We have a goal for 2030. We have another goal for 2340. 
but there needs to be some actions behind it. There needs to be the certainty because you don't get anyone to put five million of their own money to invest in more equipment. You don't get anyone to put a hundred million behind a factory. You don't get anyone to say, let's, let's buy a vessel because we think it's going to come. It's just not how the world works. And, and the industry have come for a place where they said, look at those targets. It's, it's amazing. Let's invest. And then everyone invested. And three years later, I have to do write down on the books and lay off people and all that. And I think the industry needs to mature a little bit to that and, and actually say, OK, everyone in this industry actually have to be sustainable long term. That's the way we drive an, an industrialization. And that's how we bring industry back to Australia as well. Uh, yeah, I, I think the um the easy answer how we get the first three to four gigawatts is subsidies, but we don't just want a sugar hit. And you know, you do need to have that long-term roadmap to give industry confidence. Um, you know, we've been involved in markets where the subsidies have been there and then they've disappeared. And what that does for the sustainability of the industry is, yeah, it's you're better to have no boom than to have boom and bust. I think. Just um, from a European perspective, I would say uh, <clears throat> most of the supply chain today, turbines, vessels in, are in Europe. Huh? I think I, I heard in the previous panel, FID dates 27, 28, you should realize that as from 26 onwards, uh, Europe is lacking capacity in terms of installation vessels, turbines, electrical equipment, anything out of the supply chain. Uh, so we are lacking this capacity in Europe to realize projects which already have today reached FID or are close to reaching FID. Huh? So the supply chain won't be there anymore in 26, uh, <laughs> coming out of Europe at least, if you don't react. And I think in one of the previous discussions it was already mentioned, if we want to make these targets, you know, FID 27, 28, I think action is urgent and needed, so let's say, to start developing uh, the supply chain. That is, uh, I think, something you should realize. So. Uh, just totally agree. I will only add that uh, streamlining all the processes to get there, including permitting, because we've heard the permitting process could go from three, four years into 10 plus. Obviously, Australia needs to be on the short period just to achieve those targets in time. And also the longer it takes to bring a project to life, the more cost it comes, the more uncertainty. So I will say that simplifying the process is going to be critical. Eric, you mentioned vessels and lack of availability. And I know there's um, sort of numbers being thrown around. We need seven, seven times the volume of vessels that we have now to achieve um, or to deliver the offshore wind that's being proposed. And um, as many people that have traveled to this event will know, Australia is, is quite a way away from, from, um, from Europe, from, from many parts of the world. What do we do about vessels? How do we ensure that there are vessels? I mean, Australia's looking to build its own submarines. Do we need to be uh, having an, an Australian flag installation vessel that we can charter out? You know, how do we make sure we can actually um, build these offshore wind farms? Um, I think uh, it was covered at supply chain, and I fully agree with Eric, it should be played on a regional level. It doesn't make sense for one country to try to get all the capabilities. It doesn't have the volume, at least on the early phases. Japan, South Korea, they are building at the moment uh, wind, wind uh, turbine installation vessels. Um, the US as well, Europe. So I think Asia Pacific that has this opportunity to look at the of that collaboration as a single region and try to benefit from that. Probably also once we move into floating, I also believe Japan, Korea may have a, a big play here because that's a dominant technology in the future. Um, I'm sure Australia could have shipyards and have the capability, but again, coming back to Danny's point, it's all about timing and when do you reach that critical mass to justify uh, such an investment. I will try to play that on a regional level. Yeah, and, and there is companies. We we, we have um, we've been approached by Australian companies who wants to build the vessels and have good concepts and all that. But again, nobody builds them without the certainty in the market. 
All right. I have a question on social license before we um, look to wrap up. But uh, yesterday, in, in his opening remarks, um, Ben Backwell said that we're not going to be able to build anything if people don't want us to, nice and simple. Um, uh, from the group here, is there um, some, some learnings you can share around social licence and engaging with communities to ensure that um, projects aren't delayed and facing undue costs due to not being able to get that community support? Yeah, I, I do think we're in a better position with offshore perhaps than we were when we started with other technologies. I think we do have a bit of time on our side with offshore. Um, you know, when you look around APAC, the decarbonisation challenge and the energy security challenge for the likes of Japan or, or Korea, they need offshore now. And, um, you know, we'd like to have offshore now, but at the same time, we can get a lot of green electrons from our onshore and, and solar projects out there. So we do have time to get it right with the community. And I, I think we need to spend that time now. And, you know, the government's doing the right thing, going out and consulting on the zones before, before they're declared. Um, we're starting to see some pushback on that, so I just would strongly suggest that the um, it's not hurried that we, we take our time with this because community is going to take some time to come on board. It's typically something that also would require, I, I think, a very good even strategic cooperation between developers on the one hand, but also governments, uh, political leadership. I think the minister showed some of that this morning. Uh, political leadership expressing the will to go to renewable energy. And as a, an industry, uh, I, I think once the, the leases have been awarded and the CFDs have been awarded, we should work together on those aspects to, to improve, let's say, the social acceptance of, of uh, offshore wind, which is also something, a model that we've seen at several places in Europe and that can work and certainly help to facilitate, let's say, social uh, acceptance of offshore wind. Yeah, I think collaboration is key to doing renewables right. Uh, now, to avoid keeping anyone um, from their lunch, uh, do you want to do a final question just along the line? So I might start with you, Danny. Now, to ensure we can harness Australia's potential to bolster the allure of the entire APEC region for global investors, uh, as the question stated for this session, um, just quickly in sort of 60 seconds, what's something you think we should pause, stop and start um, for the Australian offshore industry? That's a good question. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a really, really good question. I, I, think, I think it's the, the, the offshore industry in Australia is not about if and maybe as the, the market needs the power and, and the economic advantage to go towards renewable is well documented. I think we need to continue to push that message out in the communities. I think we need to continue to, what to call, be positive around the energy transitions we are in, because there's not really any alternative. And, and I, think, I think people still, the general public still sits a little bit, oh, but maybe we can wait, and if we, we kind of don't do it, maybe it gets better and all that. But the matter of the fact is that, that we are taking a power generation out of the system and we need something to replace it. And, and the one thing we don't have and we don't get more of is time. And unless we, we get that leadership into to the industry, both from politicians, developers, manufacturers, ourselves, we're simply not going to get there quick enough. And I think, I think that message we need to drive much more to the industry. And that will get offshore of the off the cuff as well. We'll take that as we need to start pushing that message. <laughs> Fernando's, pause, stop, start. Um, I will probably pause at this uh, earlier stage with Gippsland, uh, the Glare Zone, Hunter, and, and try to get as much consensus around that uh, framework to build from that the right foundation for the industry. We've seen in other countries by early, I wouldn't say mistakes, but uh, not getting it right from the beginning that will brought a lot of delay to the whole industry and we don't have that time. I will try to stop seeing energy transition as a race between companies, countries, states. Uh, this is a heavy industry and we really need to bring all the strengths together and, and find a way to work as, as an industry, as a country, as, an, as a region. 
and probably I will start uh, opening the doors of that information lesson learned, uh, the uh, Australia joining that global group uh, to share best practices. It's going to be very important to minimize the, the mistakes we make in this early phase. Excellent, Henrietta? Yeah, no, I think we, we saw a, a great example of, of leadership this morning with the, the minister and, and uh, definitely sort of, a, um, you can say, um, Australia can, can uh, show that to, to the rest of the region and, and, and uh, be, a, be a good role model for that and uh, also have uh, hopefully the long-term play and the courage to have the long-term play and hopefully sort of that will, we will see uh, um, uh, uh, Australia-wide uh, offshore wind target soon uh, so that, uh, that uh, the APAC pipeline can, can sort of be expanded by, by that uh, Australian target and, and sort of in, in that sense, um, yeah, really, really contribute to the wider region in, in, that, in that way. Excellent, thanks. Matt? Yeah, I agree um, we should be pausing the, um, the auction rollout at this point. I know Minister Bowen wouldn't like that, but um, just to get these rules right so that we don't run into, um, you know, risks around competition law and also the risks of making projects econom uneconomic through financial bidding. Um, and as far as starting, I think, you know, this, this regional collaboration, just having more and more of this dialogue and I think this conference has been a very useful starting point for that. Excellent, and finally, Eric? Okay, I think uh, I can only agree with everything <laughs> that's been said, so I won't repeat it, but perhaps one last one, not to forget, I would say, and which has not been discussed in this panel yet. I would say to Australia, make also sure that your grids are ready for receiving all this offshore wind energy, because that's a bottleneck in most of the markets also, <laughs> still in Europe, unfortunately. Excellent. All right, now we can all start lunch, but please join me in thanking my panellists and invite you all to go and enjoy some lunch. Thank you.